Okay, so here we are with part two of the cellular respiration essentials, and then we'll go all the way down to have our quiz, and the quiz will cover both parts one and two. All right, so let's get started. Okay, so if oxygen is present, um, this next step will proceed. So if we're talking about, let's say, us, this will occur in our mitochondria. So the Krebs or the citric acid cycle, we're going to talk about making two substrate level equivalents um, of ATP, which is called GTP. We will reduce six NADs and two FADs. Remember, these are the transporters, electron transport that's going to go to electron transport chain. But first, before we do that, the pyruvate from the end of glycolysis will end up getting stripped of one of the carbons, okay? And oxygen will bind to it, forming carbon dioxide that you breathe out. But in the process of going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, um, a NAD will be reduced. Because remember, if you're stripping off the carbons, you're releasing electrons, like I said, an electron carrier will have to pick it up. So here's the NAD that will go to electron transport chain. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Krebs cycle. I'm not going to go into massive details with all the enzymes and stuff, but I do want to show you what's happening here. All right, so the acetyl-CoA that we see up here that was made through that conversion of the pyruvate from glycolysis, if oxygen is present, will then enter that acetyl group, CoA will leave. The acetyl is a two carbon molecule, see, one, two. That will actually enter into the Krebs cycle and join acetoacetate, which is a four carbon structure to form citrate. So this is citrate, six carbons, all right? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so going from, going to the next day, citrate becomes isocitrate by an isomerase. This is showing you the structural differences between the two so you can see it. But going from isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, I want you to notice that's something interesting happening here. Remember, isocitrate was a six carbon, okay, molecule. Going from isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate here, we are now taking off a carbon. We're stripping off a carbon, decarboxylating it, and we end up with five carbons now. Remember the rule that I told you. If you're stripping off a carbon, we see the carbon here, it's going to become carbon dioxide and leave as we breathe out. But we end, but when we take off a carbon, we're also releasing electrons. So who's going to be there to pick it up? Nad the taxi cab. Here it is being reduced. It will shuttle it down to electron transport chain. Going from alpha ketoglutarate, which is a five carbon, to succinyl CoA, we are still taking off another carbon. So here we're going to end up with four carbons. Okay, so here we had five. Now here we're going to have four. One, two, three, four. So that carbon that was stripped or decarboxylated would then bind with oxygen and leave as carbon dioxide. That's what we breathe out. And remember the rule, if you're stripping off a of carbon, electrons are also released. So who's there to pick it up? Nad the taxi cab. There it is right there. It's going to shuttle those electrons down to electron transport. Now this is a very important step here. Going from succinyl-CoA to succinate, we have a GTP being produced substrate level, okay? So at this step, an ATP equivalent is made called GTP, okay? So we see it here. So we usually refer to this as an ATP production substrate level. So we see we have ATP being produced here, okay? Oops, erase that. So ATP being produced here. All right, so that's a very important step. Now going from succinate to fumarate, there, is, there are some structural differences that occur here that will allow fat to become reduced. Okay, so due to electrons and hydrogens present, um, it will become reduced, and this one will also get shuttled to electron transport, okay, just like NADs. Going from fumarate to malate, um, we don't really have any NADs or any fads or any anything getting reduced. But going from malate 
back to acetate, what we see is that a NAD is being reduced at this stage. Okay, So if we take a look, I'm just going to um, change this a little bit. We have one, two, and three NADs that are being produced. So three NADs right, um, that are reduced per pyruvate or per pyruvic acid that was oxidized. And we had one FAD being reduced. Okay, Both of those are going to electron transport to make ATP later on. So this is per one pyruvate or per one pyruvic acid, okay? But remember, we have two per glucose molecule. So whatever we see here, we have to multiply it by two. So this will actually be six NADs reduced. This will actually be two FADs that are reduced because remember, this is per pyruvate, and we had two pyruvates per glucose molecule. So the, this has to turn twice, for every glucose molecule, okay? So that means that we end up with two ATP equivalents, okay? Because here we're showing you one, but remember it occurs twice. So we have three NAS reduced, one FAD reduced, and two ATP equivalents being produced. All right, so what is the next step here? All right, this can be quite challenging, but I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm not going to go into the massive details on what's actually going here. But what I do want to talk about is this very important pump here called ATP synthase. Okay, ATP synthase is found in the mitochondrial membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane, and it plays a role um, in conjunction with the electron transport chain to actually drive ATP production. But the ATP that's being produced in electron transport, because that's what we're looking at now, is from oxidative phosphorylation. So at this point, up until we got here, we did not make a lot of ATP. We only had two ATP net gain from um, glycolysis. And then we had two ATP equivalents in Krebs cycle. That's not a lot. That is really not a lot at all. So we only made four substrate level ATP. So that means the rest of it has to come through oxidative phosphorylation because for every glucose molecule, we end up with 36 to 38 ATPs. So we only used four, made four. Okay, so let's take a look what's happening to the rest of it. Now the ATP synthase will use um, concentration gradients and hydrogens to help drive its production of ATP. So there's two complexes to it. This is very simple. It's not showing you it. There's a FO or FO and a Fe complex where you have ADP plus PI that can then get converted to ATP and water once it is turned on and it actually becomes functional when hydrogens flow through it. All right, so let's take a closer look here of how ATP synthase becomes active. All right, so remember all those NADs and FADs that were built up in the other stages? Here's NAD, here's FAD. What they do, they drop off their electrons and hydrogens. Now this line here is representing electrons, right? The flow of electrons, and that will kind of generate um, some energy. But what I'm really interested in here are these hydrogens that were also dumped off. All right, so these are the proteins involved in the electron transport system. I'm not going to talk about those in detail here because that in itself will be a very long video. Um, but it's actually done in several stages, and they will pass on the electrons that were picked up before. But I want you to see all these hydrogens um, that were dumped off by NADs and FADs. They will actually get pumped across the membrane, okay? So all those hydrogens, they get pumped across the membrane, and you're going to build up a very high level of hydrogen concentration here. They're charged hydrogen atoms. 
All right, so that buildup of hydrogen is going to make this region a little acidic and kind of give it this weird charge property to it. And it's getting upset because these hydrogens just want to leave. But because they are charged, they can't just go through the membrane. Remember the following concentration gradient, concentration gradient going from high, they want to go to low. But they cannot go through the membrane. There's only one way that they can leave. And the only way they can leave is through this pump called ATP or the pump or enzyme called ATP synthase. Okay. ATP synthase. Remember, that's the one I was talking about over here. All right, as the hydrogens flow through, right, because you remember they are wanting to leave, they actually drive this ATP synthase to make ATP. You know, synthase means to make. Here we have ATP being made. So as the hydrogens from all the NADs and FADs that were dumped off here, as they go through, they turn on ATP synthase to make ADP, ATP from ADP and PI. All right, so all those, so the concentration gradients, all those hydrogens, where do they come from? The NADs and the FADs. Because remember, when they got reduced, they took in hydrogens. The hydrogens are pumped across, and they build up a concentration, and they want to leave. The only way they can leave is through ATP synthase. So as they go through the pump, they activate it to actually make ATP. This whole process is an all that happened down here is an oxidative process. And that oxidative process will drive the oxidative phosphorylation and electron transport to make ATP. Okay, let me make some room here. All right, so all of those, okay, using all those hydrogens to, so using the hydrogens, using the principles of oxidative phosphorylation um, will drive the response of ATP synthase to make ATP. That is the chemiosmosis, chemiosmosis um, principle here. So chemiosmosis will use these hydrogens as it builds up a concentration gradient. Um, as it flows through, the ATP synthase pump will drive ATP production. So this is chemiosmosis using those chemical hydrogens and chemical properties and concentration gradients to drive ATP reaction. This is through oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so now let's talk about the conversion factor before I review it. For every NAD and every FAD that was reduced, there's an ATP equivalency that we're going to talk about. So for every NAD that is reduced, we will get approximately three ATPs that can be made through oxidative phosphorylation. For every FAD that was reduced, we can end up with about two ATPs that is being produced um, through oxidative phosphorylation. So now let's do the breakdown of how we got 36 to 38 ATPs per glucose molecule. So to start off, I'm going to put glycolysis here. All right, glycolysis. All right, in glycolysis, we ended up with two ATPs that were being made through substrate level phosphorylation directly in the pathway, all right? So we also had two NADs that were reduced, two NADs that were reduced in um, glycolysis. So if we talk about two ATPs through oxidative phosphorylation, so that'll be two ATPs. But now let's talk about the equivalent. If we had two NADs that were actually reduced, remember I said for every NAD, we see here for every NAD, we will have three ATPs that can be made. So if we're looking at these two NADs here, that means the equivalency is two times three equals six ATPs. Okay, six ATPs. All right, so let's shift over here 
to the preparatory stage. That preparatory stage, is, remember, is going from that pyruvate to the acetyl-CoA. In there, we actually have two NADs that are being reduced. Okay, two NADs. What's the equivalency? Remember, three ATPs per one NAD. So two times three is six ATPs. Okay, ATPs. Oops. Okay, let me write that better. Six ATPs. All right, so I'm going to put this in red. Now we have, these are oxidative phosphorylation ATPs because NADs um, went through that oxidative process to build them up. And the substrate level I'm going to put in green here, okay? All right, so let's go back. So that's that prep stage. Now the next stage was the Krebs, okay, or citric acid. And in Krebs, there's a little bit more going on here. We have, let's start out with ATP substrate level. We had two GTP or ATP equivalents, all right, and that was substrate level. So that was two ATPs um, substrate level. So I'm going to put that in green, okay? Then we had NADs. Let's talk about our NADs. We had actually a lot of NADs that were reduced reduced in this point. So we ended up with six NADs getting reduced. Okay. And you remember the equivalency for every NAD is about three ATPs that can be made. So with that said, three times six equals 18 ATPs. Okay. I'm going to put that in red because that is through oxidative phosphorylation and electron transport that we saw this happening. Okay, so now we've seen what happened in the Krebs cycle regarding substrate level ATP and the oxidative equivalency for the NADs to ATP. So now let's take a look at our last um, electron acceptor that we saw in the Krebs cycle, which was FAD. Okay, remember we had two FADs that were actually reduced. And remember, for every FAD that is reduced, we have approximately two ATPs, so two times two is four. So four ATPs. All right, and let's go ahead and put that in red because those are made through oxidative phosphorylation. All right, so let's do the total count of what we saw here. So let's start off with the substrate level phosphorylation. So we had two ATPs made um, in the Krebs in glycolysis. So we had two, and then we had two substrate level ATPs that were actually made in the Krebs cycle. So two plus two is four. So that's through substrate level phosphorylation, okay? All right, so we're trying to do our total count now. Now I'm gonna put this in red because remember, we only have four so far, and for every glucose molecule, we end up with 36 to 38 ATPs. So let's do the substrate level, the, I mean not substrate level, the oxidative level counts, okay? So in the glycolysis, we have six ATPs that were made through the NADs, okay? All right, now if we look at that intermediate step, all right, from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we had two NADs that were oxidized, I mean reduced for oxidative phosphorylation. So that generated six ATPs. And then we also, from the NADs in the Krebs cycle, we have 18 oxidative phosphorylation ATPs that could be reduced here. And the two fats that were reduced, we ended up with four ATPs through oxidative phosphorylation. So if we take a look, we have 6 plus 6 is 12, plus 18 is 30, and 4 is 34, okay? And this is through oxidative, okay? So if we take a look a little bit further now, the total count at this point is 4, right? 4 from substrate level and 34 from the oxidative phosphorylation gives you the 38 
ATPs that we see from one glucose molecule. All right, so it seems like oxidative phosphorylation is the more effective way of generating. So when oxygen is present, it actually is more beneficial in terms of making the amount of ATPs that you need. The ATPs that were generated through substrate level, that's like tips that a waiter gets. That's instant money that they can use right away. But when we talk about the paycheck where we have the payroll processing, that's equivalent to electron transport. So each of those NADs and FADs that were reduced will then later on go to drive ATP syn synthesis um, through oxidative phosphorylation. So this is the breakdown. From one glucose molecule, you end up with 30 Eight ATPs. If you don't count the count the GTP equivalent, then that's when we have our 36. All right, that was a lot of stuff, a lot of information, and this was just an overview. Okay, so remember, from one glucose molecule, we end up with 36 to 38 ATPs using substrate level phosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation, and that chemiosmosis that we spoke about really is that driving force in electron transport um, for the oxidation process. So let's go through the quizzing. I want to see how you guys do. All right, which of the following can be carried out in anaerobic all right, conditions? Okay, that means it doesn't require oxygen. Is it Krebs cycle slash citric acid cycle? Is it glycolysis, electron transport system, or that in intermediate step conversion of pyruvate to the acetyl-CoA? Which one is it? All right, so hopefully you picked glycolysis, all right? Glycolysis is the anaerobic response here. Where does glycolysis occur, all right? So the initial stage is glycolysis. Does it occur in the blood, mitochondria, and the cytoplasm, or the nucleus? Hopefully you picked cytoplasm. From one glucose molecule, one glucose molecule, okay? How many ATPs can be generated through cellular respiration? So I'm talking about using substrate level and oxidative level phosphorylation. Hopefully you picked 36 to 38 ATPs per glucose molecule. What type of process is used to generate ATP in electron transport system? Is it photophosphorylation? Is it oxidative phosphorylation? Is it substrate level phosphorylation? Or none of the above? Well, I hope you picked oxidative phosphorylation, okay? Because remember, substrate level does not occur in electron transport. That occurs at site, like in Krebs cycle or glycolysis. After becoming reduced... Where do the NADs and FADs go? Remember all those NADs and FADs that were generated? Does it go to the Krebs cycle? Does it go to the citric acid cycle? Does it go to electron transport system or the cytoplasm? Hopefully you picked electron transport system. Next question. How many ATPs are made through substrate level in traditional glycolysis? Okay. All right, so here we have 0, 2, 4, or 6 ATPs. What's the net gain in glycolysis? If you pick 2 ATPs, you are correct. All right, next question. What is or are the end products of traditional gly glycolysis? Is it citrate? Is it 1 pyruvic acid? 2 pyruvic acids? 6 reduced NADs? Or none of the above? Hopefully you pick two pyruvic acids or two pyruvates. They're the same thing that we see here. Next question. How many NADs are reduced in the citric acid cycle, a.k.a. Krebs cycle, per glucose molecule? Okay. Is it one, two, three, four, five, six? Remember, that's the one that looked like the circle, right? And then you had the acetyl-CoA going in. All right, so hopefully you picked six, okay? 
I know a lot of students kind of mix it up and they pick three, but it would be three per pyruvate. But when we're talking about per glucose molecule, you remember we end up with two pyruvates. So it has to go through the cycle twice. So three times two is six. All right, um, which of the following plays a role or a key player in chemiosmosis driving ATP synthase? So now we're talking about electron transport. What are some of the critical things that drives ATP synthase or synthesis, sorry, during chemiosmosis? So I obviously gave away one of the answers, ATP synthase, all right? So ATP synthase is a key player. And what it uses are the hydrogens that have built up, right? And because it built up, there are concentration gradients that are also building up. So the, there's three of them here that play a role in chemiosmosis and driving ATP synthesis. And that's hydrogen concentrations, um, hydrogen and concentration gradients and ATP synthase, which is activated or functional when these hydrogens go through. Okay, so hopefully you did okay on this. I know this is a very tough concept to grasp. I hope that this video kind of clarified some things for you. Um, if it didn't, just leave a comment or leave a comment below on what you learned or if you found it helpful. And just let me know generally how you're doing in this topic. So thanks for watching this video and until the next time, bye.